Hello, we're going to talk about in the second half of the semester or trimester, we're going to talk about argumentation. The first trimester focuses on information, particularly dealing with scientific historical topics, um, personal histories, telling your own story, um, telling the stories of others around you, telling the stories of your heroes. The second one is also, and I hope you will be able to see and follow how storytelling is so vital even in the process of argumentation. However, in argumentation there is a, uh, some other kinds of structures going on and particularly there is the use of logic and logic becomes far more important in argumentation now the communicate the speech communication program offers many courses on speaking on communication and even entire courses on argumentation and so unfortunately we won't be able to delve quite as deeply into that topic um, at this time. However, uh, the one of the final acts of this trimester before you um, take your final quiz will be to prepare a persuasive speech. And so as you are preparing this persuasive speech, then it's important to understand how to build the kind of argumentation that goes into persuading someone, particularly persuading someone to change their mind. Of course, the first step, um, it bears repeating, we've talked about it before, um, you have to consider your audience. Listening is essential. Listening is the kind of discipline that um, we all need to learn because many times arguments um, occur based on misunderstanding and many misunderstandings occur because of the lack of dedicated um, comprehensive empathetic listening right um, there's a quote. I don't remember where it came from. I've looked, tried to find it. Most people do not listen to understand. They listen to reply. So you'll notice that some people are like half listen to um, the conversation that they're in in order to find that break so that they can interject the thing that they want to say. They're not interested in understanding what the other person says. In comprehending and empathizing, they simply want to break to assert themselves. Um, if we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, according to the Jewish tradition, the great commandment begins with a word. In Hebrew, the great commandment begins with the word Shema. Shema Israel. And Deuteronomy 6.4 begins with the word Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. Right? When Jesus was on earth and the Pharisees asked him about what he believed was the most important command. This is the command he gave, right? But it all starts with, hear, O Israel, listen. The very first um, aspect of showing love and of serving others is to listen to them is to understand what they're saying, understand where they're coming from, 
and be prepared to uh, to meet needs where they are. Now, this this lesson tonight, this uh, this speak, uh, lecture is going to be covering chapter nine and part of chapter ten in your textbook. Chapter 10 is actually the, the meat and potatoes of argumentation, and so it may bear more than one uh, lecture to finish it. But chapter 9, I want to tell you up front that I'm not completely in agreement with the way the author presents it. Rothwell um, creates a form of a form of um, status quo that he calls true belief and the process of true belief and then he problematizes this thing that he calls true belief and basically for him true belief is some kind of a uh, a, a state of mind in which you are willing to ignore all evidence and simply um, simply act or react contrary to evidence. And I would say as a defense of myself that I don't believe faith in God is contrary to evidence in this sense. But um, we're going to, um, so I just wanted to give that little caveat uh, regarding the book of uh, that true belief uh, or their definition of true belief uh, is very difficult for me to go along with. However, there are three terms um, based on the science, the scientific process. All right. Actually, let me add a. Uh, uh, The scientific process um, the Greeks were the ones who defined the scientific process. And the scientific process was a process of arriving at an understanding of first principles of the world. Through the process of Ration, rational, uh, of rational thought and observation. Now, out of this process, there emerged um, several factions, and we know the names of these factions, but. We've forgotten, oh, many people have forgotten the basis from which they came. So we have, um, I'll, I'm just going to mention three. We have the critics, the skeptics, and the cynics. These are actually um, different philosophies of thought that emerged in ancient Greece in the 4th and 3rd century BC that gave rise to 
rationalism and, and the understanding of, of science or kind of forming the foundations of science as we think of it. Of course, um, Stoicism um, had certain particular methodologies that contributed to this as well, uh, particularly the, the process of interpretation and analogy where they could um, see one principle occurring in nature and then create an analogy in which they could understand other thing other like things or examples um, and this also is the basis for experimentation right if we can in a controlled environment um, observe a cycle of cause and effect and we can reproduce that cycle of cause and effect then we have the ability to extrapolate from that um, larger principles but it is required so basically for the purposes here it is required that we have keen observation and that through our observation we submit the evidence to a process of scrutiny. All right. And so chapter 9 is dealing with this process of scrutiny um, and they pick up here the word of cynicism. Of course, um, that has a completely different connotation these days. The cynic is someone um, in, in our modern vernacular, someone who has kind of given up on life, who is embittered toward life. That wasn't the original um, use of it. And there's some good uh, evidence of that. But I digress. Um, the book uses skepticism as the standard, and we'll go ahead and, and use that term as the standard for, um, a, for building arguments. So skepticism, uh, according to our book, is the process of inquiry whereby claims are evaluated by engaging in a rigorous examination of the evidence and reasoning used to support those claims. You have the claims, you have evidence, and then you have reasoning. Those are the three pieces of argumentation. And we're going to get more in depth into that process in a little bit. But this brings us to another aspect um, in argumentation that we're going to face very soon and since it is brought up here in chapter 9 and um, I, I as I said I disagree with the book I want to go ahead and address it um, from my own perspective first of all everyone who looks at truth has a set of biases all right we all have a set of biases. The word bias has, has the idea of preconceived notions or preset principles. And I would prefer that, um, that analysis myself. Some preset principles that I assume. And so um, as I am... As I am approaching an argument, as I am approaching um, uh, a situation in which I will be interacting with others and dialoguing, um, the most, the best way for you to be objective is to be honest about your biases. Right? There's no person who doesn't have biases. And when I, the, the word I'm using for biases is some preset principles 
of how to judge, how to interpret, how to understand truth, right? And I personally believe that there is an ultimate truth. Now, there are some people who claim they don't believe in ultimate truth, and um, as, my, as one of my um, teachers once asked, is it possible to be absolutely partial? And of course, uh, that's kind of a redundancy in, uh, in terms. This, this process of, to, to say that there is no absolute truth is kind of an absolute statement in itself, right? Um, and so we understand from that that there are formulations in which people try to avoid facing ultimate truth. Whereas, uh, as debaters, as people building argument, as people attempting to persuade others, and specifically as Christians, trying to give an answer for the hope that is within us, we have to be, we have to be able to look at what is kind of behind the scenes and make it evident, both in our own hearts and minds, and then in order to bring it to others as well. Now, I want you to take a look at this picture. If you need to, you may pause the video and contemplate it for a minute. What do you see in this picture? As you contemplate this picture, different people see different things in the picture. Some people say they see a vase or a chalice. Uh, one of my students said they saw um, the rook, uh, one of the pieces in a chess set. And then of course, others say that they see two people facing each other. Two silhouettes of people facing each other, right? One part is backgrounded, the other part is foregrounded. Both of those things are available and visible in, in this image. And this may help uh, for us to understand that in order for the background to exist, in order for the foreground to exist, the background also has to exist, right? And so our ability to be able to realize what is behind the scenes, what is not obvious, and be able to articulate that and express that um, is very important as a foundational principle in understanding truth. So, um, there's another principle that I believe, so I believe that there is ultimate truth. Um, I could say that the Stoics, the ancient, um, again, one of the ancient Greek factions that um, developed strong philosophical tradition, believed in an ultimate truth. I've been uh, reading a book over the, the break and um, for the last two or three weeks we um, got a book um, of, from, one of the, from one of the main um, characters who established speech communication as a discipline in universities and his name is Marshall McLuhan. Perhaps you've heard the name. Um, he had, wrote a very famous book called The Medium is the Message, or The Medium is the Massage. And his original work was in classical education. 
going all the way back to the ancient Greeks and Romans and bringing that forward. It's called The Classical Trivium, The Place of Thomas Nash in the Learning of His Time. Now, um, this book gives us a brief background on Stoic philosophy. And I quote, A brief consideration of Stoic philosophy will serve to indicate how the study of language and poetry could become completely wedded to the study of physics and ethics. Vernon Arnold's fine study of Roman Stoicism points out the influence of the Chaldeans who in or about the year 2800 BC mapped out the constellations as we know them, traced the orbits of the planets and predicted their future movements, and whose work was stimulated by the belief that the skies displayed a written message to mankind. From the Chaldean teaching, Arnold goes on to say, citing the authority of Cicero and Seneca, two principles seem to have survived those of the inexorable tie between cause and effect. Called fate. And of the interdependence of events in heaven and earth. For the Stoics, however, the doctrine of fate is quite reconcilable with the doctrine of the providential government of the world. And further, Beside the personal and material conceptions of the deity, they adopted and developed a conception which exercised an extraordinary influence over other systems when they attributed the exercise of all the powers of deity to the divine word, which from one point of view is the deity himself, and from another is something which emanates from him and is in some way distinct." End of quote of Arnold. Um, I could say very briefly that the Stoics were considered um, in Greece at the time as atheistic. And they used the word atheos um, to mean that the Stoics did not believe in the gods as in the ancient Greek and Roman gods of Zeus and Hera and uh, um, Hades and so on, right? The pantheon of, of Greek gods. So they were at Theos by not believing in the plurality of the Greek gods of Homer and Hesiod. However, the Stoics did believe in the Logos, or the Word as it's called here, right? And that this Logos was the standard of ultimate truth. And the point of all investigation is to arrive at this place of ultimate truth. McLuhan continues, Conf Confronted with the great doctrine of the Logos, it is perhaps easier to understand how grammar and etymology should have been esteemed as means of investigating both the nature of deity and the natures of phenomena. So theology... Physics and metaphysics um, held equal interest and application for the ancient Greek pursuit of science. Inseparable from the doctrine of the Logos is the cosmological view of the rerum natura, the affairs of nature, as the whole, and as a continuum, at once a network of natural causes and an order naturae, the natural order, whose least pattern expresses analogically a divine message. This notion, already implicit in the Chaldean cosmology, is the very basis of Plato's Timaeus, the work of his which had the greatest influence of any of his works, both in antiquity and in medieval times. 
If its full influence is to be explained, this dialogue should be seen as a statement of a cosmology already many centuries old, and one which had, long after Plato's own day, exponents as different as the Pythagoreans and the Stoics. End of quote. Um, so, I said all that to say that the study of science from ancient times has never been considered as antithetical to the study of the deity or the study of the Logos or the study of ultimate truth. In fact, for many, um, all down through the centuries, they have been one and the same. Secondly, as I have there on my third bullet point, I want to point out that science or the scientific method is not the final answer in arriving at ultimate truth. Even the Greeks would have agreed with that all the way down to the present day. Um, and this is one of the battles of our day, if you want to term it in that way, that we believe that science can answer all questions. The scientific method is simply tools of analysis, right? Science can reproduce ex through experimentation, through measurement and observation, the ability to understand and see that which is understandable and seeable. However, there are effects in existence in the universe which um, people sometimes call metaphysics, which fall outside the scope of science. If they can't be measured with instruments, quantified, observed, and in some way controlled and reduplicated, that falls outside of the scope of science. And so, we can talk about things that actually exist, and as Christians, we believe, as Jesus said, the wind bloweth whither it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but thou knowest not whither it, where it cometh, nor whither it goeth. So is um, being born of the Spirit, right? There are spiritual effects which we can observe but which we cannot quantify, measure, and re reduplicate in a scientific way and therefore they fall outside of the realm of observable science. I'll come back to the definition of logic later. Um, however, having clearly in your mind an understanding of what your principles are, what you believe, what, what is non-negotiable, and not only that, but why you believe them. This time as students, some of you are... Um, freshmen, sophomores in school, um, the first time you've been to school in your life, and you're being confronted with thoughts, ideas, and issues that you never thought about before. This is a great time of life. It's a time where you'll be challenged. Um, where previously, all your previous assumptions that were fed to you by your parents and by uh, those in authority. Now, as you are stepping out on your own, as you're becoming independent, you're reassessing the things that you thought were important to you and coming up with your own conclusions. 
This is a healthy and an essential part of growing up. Through this process, you're going to have to figure out what are non-negotiables, right? Um, and as far as the question of God and does God exist, uh, like I said, I don't go along with the book's um, questioning of true belief saying that there's no evidence because I think that it is quite possible to pro to present um, much evidence for the existence and the presence of God, but there's no um, scientific, scientifically viable um, absolute proof. And even as far as that goes, even science itself rejects the idea of absolute proof of anything. Science itself um, is constantly in the process of gathering information, gathering evidence. And so when they present a claim of a, a hypothesis or a theory, they're going to say that it is a strong evidence or weak evidence. So it's going to talk about in terms of the quantity of evidence that um, can support an idea. But there's nothing that is 100% proven. And let me give you just one example. There is a, there is a department um, in governments, and even one that is a, a global government in the scientific field, that is called the Department of Standards. And the Department of Standards tells us um, about the law of gravitation. And conventional wisdom says that in general, gravitation is constant. Right, that there is um, a standard of gravitation which makes it, uh, which makes it, uh, th produces the ability to be able to measure things like weight and mass. However, the board of of measures and standards knows that even gravitation has a fluctuation, that there is no constant. If you don't um, believe me, you're, you're welcome to check it out and, and find out for, for yourself. But anyway, just that little plug that science does not have all the answers. And does not um does not arrive at necessarily the best or final um conclusions My conclusion for this is that it's important for us to know what we believe, hold our principles firmly, but also be able to hold our principles humbly. Right? Believe that there is ultimate truth. Believe that God is the ultimate standard of authority but still be humble in our own ability to comprehend uh, and to assimilate 
the truth that he presents. Right? So even though we believe God is true, what God says is true, our ability to understand it and interpret it um, does leave something to be desired. And therefore, we have to maintain a sense of humility in approaching it. We, personally, um, individually are not the standard of truth. And in this uh, chapter 9, uh, as far as dealing with evidence is concerned, it talks about using probability. You know, the difference between possibility and probability. And um, probability is based on evidence, right? Based on um, things that have happened this way for many times, like death. Um, according to most statistics, 10 out of 10 people will die, right? So the probability of death actually happening is pretty good. Um, and then other things are less probable or possible based on, you know, the, all the experience of the world. And so our ability to be able to perceive truth through analysis of evidence and probability is very important. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, and you, of course, I encourage you to read uh, chapter 9 in, in that sense. I'm going to stop this... Uh, lecture here and I am going to um, continue the lecture in chapter 10 uh, in the next on the next video.